This is Chapter 5, the integumentary system. The integumentary system includes both the cutaneous membrane, which is the skin, and its associated hairs, nails, and also glands. The integumentary system accounts for about 16% of the total body weight. There are two major components of the integumentary system. The first is the cutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane consists of both the epidermis, which is a more superficial layer of the skin, and that is uh, an epithelium, and also the dermis, which is the underlying connective tissue layer underneath the epidermis. The second component of the integumentary system are the accessory structures. Accessory structures include things like hair, nails, and many exocrine glands. We also see that there are um, sweat glands, uh, some sensory glands, and there's also a muscle called the erector pili muscle, which we'll see as we move along through this chapter. Underneath the cutaneous membrane is a layer called the hypodermis, otherwise known as the subcutaneous layer, and this separates the integument from the deep fascia around muscles and uh, body organs. Mostly, the skin and the subcutaneous layer protect the body, protect underlying tissues and organs against shocks, abrasions, and chemical attack. It also helps to maintain temperature. Heat can be lost through the blood vessels. The skin also synthesizes and stores nutrients. We're going to see how sunlight will cause a steroid in the dermal layer to convert to vitamin D3 and vitamin D3 is necessary for the absorption of calcium. So a very, very important vitamin. The integumentary system, also a sensory receptor. There are structures within the integumentary system that will sense touch, pressure, pain, and temperature and relay that information into the central nervous system. The integumentary system also involves excretion and secretion as part of its function by excreting salts and water and organic wastes and also secretion of milk in the case of the mammary glands. We're going to start by looking at the epidermis. The epidermis is again is this top layer. The epidermis is an epithelium and it's actually a stratified squamous epithelium. It helps to provide mechanical protection and keep microorganisms outside of the body. The epidermis does not contain any blood vessels anywhere in the layers and therefore we call it avascular. Most of the epithelial cells in the epidermis are keratinocytes. These keratinocytes are able to produce a protein called keratin. Keratin helps to waterproof and uh, make the skin more durable. Typically, the epidermis consists of four different layers. However, in some areas of the body, there are five layers. And five layers can be found in thick skin, such as in the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Everywhere else in the body, we have four layers. Thick and thin skin refer only to the relative thickness of the epidermis. This is a micrograph of the layers of the epidermis. The layers of the epidermis sit on this basement membrane, and the basement membrane holds the epidermis down onto the dermis. The deepest layer of the epidermis is called the stratum basal, or another name for that is stratum germinativum. In the stratum basal or stratum germinativum, there are stem cells. And in this layer, once the stem cells divide, one daughter cell will move up into the next layer. The other daughter cell will stay down in that stratum basal or stratum germinativum layer to remain as a stem cell. Once that cell, the daughter cell, has been moved up into the next layer, it's now in the stratum spinosum. In the stratum spinosum layer, there are about eight layers of these cells. And the reason why we call them spinosum is because the cells lose water in this layer. Once they lose water, they become sort of spiny. We've seen what happens when cells uh, crenate. 
as the stratum base cell continues to divide, um, bringing more daughter cells upward, the spiny cells from the stratum spinosum will move up into the stratum granulosum layer. Here we have three to five layers of cells. In the stratum granulosum layer, the protein keratin begins to be produced. Keratin is a protein that helps to make the skin more waterproof uh, and a little um, tougher. We also see on this micrograph the stratum lucidum. And again, the stratum lucidum is a layer of extra or extra layers of cells that um, are only found in thick skin areas, which mean they're only found in the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. From the stratum granulosum, the cells will move up into the stratum corneum layer. In the stratum corneum layer, this is the most superficial layer, and the cells die and they flatten out. There's about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells. Keratinization occurs at this time, which is the process of forming more protective superficial layers of these keratin cells. It takes about 15 to 30 days for a cell to move all the way from the stratum germinativum layer, or stratum basal layer, all the way up to the stratum corneum layer. Dead cells will generally remain in the corneum layer for about two weeks, and then they are shed. Again, what we're talking about here is the epidermis. And so there are no blood vessels in the epidermis. In the layer below, which is called the dermis, there are blood vessels. If a person were to work out and sweat, or if they were to get a fever and sweat, that type of perspiration would be called sensible perspiration. But if a person were to get some type of laceration or abrasion to the epidermal layers without going into the dermis, then the fluid that would be lost there would be a clear fluid coming out of the epidermal area and that would be called insensible perspiration. A person that has a lot of insensible perspiration can actually end up dehydrated. So we think about people that have uh, a burn across much of their skin and the epidermal layer has been burned off, they would end up with quite a bit of insensible perspiration and could become dehydrated. Blisters are a fluid accumulation as a result in the connections between the superficial and the deep layers of the epidermis. And fluid fills into those pockets and become blisters. Another cell that is found in the stratum basal layer is called a melanocyte. In this picture we can see this big brown cell here, that's called a melanocyte. From the melanocyte we get small vesicles that are called melanosomes. Inside the melanosomes is a pigment called melanin. So the melanocyte produces the melanin and the melanin leaves the melanocyte in these little vesicles called melanosomes and those melanosomes will migrate upward into higher layers of the epithelium. In a person with darker skin, the melanosomes are going to move closer towards the surface of the skin, so perhaps in the stratum granulosum layer. Whereas a person with lighter skin color, the melanosomes might only migrate up to a, a lower epithelial layer like the spinosum layer. Now what the melanocytes and the melanin do in the cells is they sort of surround the nucleus of the cell so that when sunlight, which carries with it UV radiation, hits the skin, it's not going to be able to penetrate past the melanosomes, past the melanin to the nucleus where it could actually damage the DNA. It's not how many melanocytes there are that will determine a person's skin color but instead it will, it will be how fast the melanocyte can process the melanin and uh, produce the melanin that will give the person their skin color. So the more melanin that's produced, 
the darker the skin color will be. There are other factors that deal with the pigmentation in the epidermis. There is a pigment called carotene. Carotene can naturally be found in carrots, cantaloupe, and this is an orange-yellow pigment, and it can accumulate in the epidermal cells. When it accumulates in those cells, then you can um, see an orangish tint to the skin. I don't know if you've ever seen a baby with uh, pale skin or with uh, light-colored skin, but if they eat a lot of the orange carrot baby food, their skin can actually turn a little bit orange. The carotene can be converted to vitamin A, which is needed for epithelial maintenance and eye photoreceptors. Another factor influencing epidermal pigmentation is dermal circulation. Blood vessels in the dermis layer uh, will bring red blood to this area, and in light-skinned people, this red blood will show through, giving the skin a pinkish color. In a person that is lacking oxygen, someone who's in a situation where they're not getting enough oxygen, they may end up with uh, more of blue blood from deoxygenated blood in the dermal area, and that would then give the skin more of a bluish tint, and we call that cyanosis. Cyanosis can especially be seen around the lips as well as the fingertips. Another thing to look at with the epidermis are the fingerprints. Fingerprints are unique to each individual and they are found in thick skin. If we look at this picture we can see the epidermis and then we can also see the dermis and we can see the connection where they fit together. And you see that they have a, not a straight edge but instead more of a curved edge. The epidermis has projections down into the dermis that are called the epidermal ridge, and the dermis has projections upward which are called dermal papilla. It's these ridges, these dermal papilla, which give a person their fingerprints. This ends this segment of the epidermis, and in the next segment we'll talk about the dermis.